else so can everyone hear me okay brilliant so hi there, folks uh, my name is philip and i'm a senior content engineer at and at Montpellier, one of our main missions is to make the world safer more useful and at the moment we have two main applications that help us uh, solve this problem uh, so we have Montpellier dtl that's our big enterprise product uh, very robust and feature-rich system for data trans uh, transport and transformation and it's supported by Montpellier data loader our uh, SaaS solution for moving data to the cloud so since last may i've been a part of the brilliant team working on the new version of the data loader work uh, rewritten from scratch with uh, react and typescript so when we oh, last one right when we started uh, the development um, that, uh, almost a year ago we uh, knew a good deal already thanks to the existing applications and user research and initial designs we had not get us started we could uh, create the first concept uh, choose the libraries we want to use and uh, design, decide on the architecture. Um, we didn't have the whole picture yet, however, we only had initial design, so we couldn't just sit down and map out all of the pages and components we would need. So we were all really excited, obviously, because how often do you get to build a big system from scratch? But uh, as we talked about it all, quickly became apparent that we might have uh, the beginnings of what's known as the second system effect. And in his, in his 1975 book, The Mythical Handman, Fred Brooks described this effect as a tendency to over-engineer the second system with all the ideas and frills that the engineer couldn't use in the first one. And you can say it comes down to overconfidence because, uh, and I think many of us have been there, because based on the previous experiences we instinctively know that this is the right abstraction, that component should be uh, more generic and this function right there will be some sort of start, some sort of an argument that will cover a future use case. And for the most part it's an amazing ability that helps us save all the time, but it can also be a subtle track if we are not careful. So we need we'll need to write it out a little bit and not get too, too carried away. Uh, and the best thing to do it will, for us was to focus on the fundamentals, not only of React, but also on the general good programming practices. So we sat down together and wrote a sort of a charter, if you will, not outlining not the uh, like specifics of any implementation, but uh, more like uh, guidelines and uh, that we wanted to follow. So this, this talk is based on experiences uh, of building up system from scratch, but of course uh, those practices, those uh, patterns will uh, translate into more mature products as well. So let's start with a big one, dry or don't repeat yourself. Uh, the term itself was coined in 1999 in Pragmatic Programmer Group, and over the years it became this uh, example of how to take a fairly simple idea and take it to an often dangerous extreme. Because even the book itself says that not all duplication is wrong, but it feels like for over 20 years we focused just on the headline. Like how often have you seen over engineered monstrosities that? Attempted to consolidate the tiniest amounts of duplication just for the sake of keeping it dry. And just, just, just for the record, I'm not saying that the basic principle is wrong, very far from it, in fact. It's just possible that uh, this drive to keep all the dry from as early as we can can lead to wrong uh, assumptions, and they in turn can lead to obstructions created too early. Because the truth is that we often pick abstractions well before we know what we're doing. And uh, the wrong abstraction might hold for the first two or three use cases, fine. Uh, and if that's all it will ever do, then it's okay because it's not wrong yet. Um, the problems start when we see something that fits our abstraction, but not completely. So we add a new prop or a new flag that will handle the new use case. And uh, time goes on, it happens a few more times. And and we end up seeing something like this in our projects. And let's be honest, this is not the worst. Many of you have probably seen uh, components that look at even worse than that. So when creating something new, be it a function, component, class, method, or a whole system even, we should absolutely repeat ourselves, use repetition on purpose, as a tool. So Ken C. Dodds described this idea as aha programming, avoid hasty abstractions. Uh, using repetition on purpose as a tool will lead us to better abstractions because we will give ourselves more time to see the more naturally. It will help us spot actual commonalities, 
or maybe even realize that they're looking at two different pieces of all together. So Ken Beck said over 20 years ago, this is such a bit of the game, that when creating software, we should make it work, make it right, and then make it fast. And notice the order of operations, because if we are abstracting too early or we are uh, optimizing too much early for that matter, we will end up doing the same steps roughly, but we will do them either out of order or straight up in reverse. So in NBL, in the modeling data loader, uh, at least in the first months, avoiding those uh, AP abstractions was really a necessity. We only had initial designs, like I said before, um, and even they only covered like the one of the core user journeys, how to create a data pipeline from MySQL to something. And just to explain, like the core idea of MDL is that the user can choose from one of the many sources we will have over 100 by this year, um, choose which data to extract, and move it to a data warehouse of their choice, so MySQL to something in this case. And uh, we could have jumped to early conclusions, we could create an abstraction early that uh, handle all of this, all of those different use cases, and all of the sources, destinations, and all of other bits of UI. And uh, actually, the first proof of concept for MDL did just that, come up with, a, uh, with an abstraction uh, first, before knowing enough of the variables. Thankfully, we did not go that way, <laughs> but uh, more about a little bit later. Okay, so what if we are not creating anything new, but we come across a component like we saw before, takes in 15 different roles, uh, handles 10 different use cases, and we are there to add the 11 one. So, something that said in her blog post, the wrong abstraction, that the sad truth is that the more complicated and incomprehensible the code, and the more effort went into creating it, uh, the more pressure we feel to remain it. Which is basically the definition of some people's policy. And that pressure can come from different places. It might be just us being afraid to mess with the old code, especially if the test coverage is not great. It can come from the management who understandably want to uh, minimize the delivery time. Or we might just be thinking, whatever, it's just an extra flag. Uh, refactoring it will be just so much more complicated. So yeah, refactoring. <laughs> refactoring is a word that I have seen give people anxiety. Uh, I've seen a junior developer who was simply overwhelmed because they just didn't know the system well enough and uh, obviously they just did not have enough practice. And on the other hand, I've seen a very senior engineer who was actually one of the authors of what was now the wrong instruction and the thought of it being wrong and uh, in the need of a rework felt to them like a personal attack. But it's crucial for us all to remember that refactoring is not a failure. It's a lesson that we have learned, it's a step in the right direction. Uh, it's an investment in time uh, that we will save in the future. Because again, the wrong abstraction probably didn't start out as wrong. Um, we always want to do the best we can. So it may have been correct at the beginning, but as time went on and more people worked on it, it became more difficult and expensive to work with it. So how should we approach refactoring the wrong abstractions? And the principle is actually really, really simple because all we need to do is extract all of the different responsibilities if in their own functions, classes, or components, whatever makes sense in the context, and reintroduce duplication, use it as a tool. Once all of those different responsibilities are extracted, it will be much clearer to see what can actually be abstracted. So if you wanted like a bullet point, like a one guiding principle that, uh, uh, that we used in the previous year of working uh, on the data loader, it would be that we should write what we know. And to me, this is one of the best pieces of advice we can apply to code. And uh, in fact, one of the best approaches to avoid those hasty abstractions, but also to prevent uh, the wrong kind of feature proofing. You know, the kind of like, is that the problem that you're running with that component needed for what you're doing now, or is it to cover some sort of a future requirement? And are you sure that this requirement not only will come up, but it will come up in that form that you're implementing? If yes, because, for example, if it's literally just the next ticket rule you're going to pick up, then sure, whatever, do, do what's best for your team. But if not, then perhaps not do it just yet, because that requirement might not, uh, might not come up in this form that you have implemented. 
and then you need to re rework it. Or even worse, uh, it might not come up at all. And let's be honest, no one will go back and clean up the phone. So now you are left with the code base that is confusing because it covers a use case that doesn't exist. So don't focus on what might be, what perhaps will be needed in the future. Focus on what you know today and write your code naturally. So speaking about code, so as an example, this is uh, as an example of, of right what you know. This is from a uh, uh, talk by John Craven, amazing talk called React Description from React Conf uh, 2019, I think. Uh, I'll link it at the end. Um, consider a menu that displays a list of plates, so like a sidebar or now something like that. Um, so one fairly common approach would be to create some sort of a configuration file with a JSON or a, like a JavaScript object that we could pass into that menu component, and the menu component will decide exactly what to render. So the configuration could look something like this, right? So this is pretty reasonable because we can now uh, use that menu component in many different contexts. It can handle many different uh, links with different uh, addresses and what have you. So this is good. This is reusable. We are happy. And the component itself will look pretty simple as well because all it needs to do is accept that list of items, map over them, and render uh, list items with links. So nothing to it. Okay, but some time passes, and a requirement comes up that we need to add a token at the end of the list uh, that, will, uh, that we will use to log out. And okay, we can still work with the abstraction that we have now. All we will need to do is uh, provide an on-click handler. So if we have a link, we will display a link, and if we have an on-click handler, we will uh, display a button. So you can, in, uh, you can implement it in a few different uh, ways. This, this is just one of them. And honestly, this doesn't look that horrible yet. If that's all it will ever do, then perhaps that's fine. Okay, but uh, what if a design changes and now we need to put that divider line above the logo button? And then it changes again and we need to put some items on the left hand side of the list. <coughs> and then it changes again because of course it does, so we need to move a couple of those items to the right of those items. And you can see how an abstraction that was created early makes sense for those initial couple of use cases, but as new, new ones were added, it quickly becomes really difficult uh, because we will need to just trudge through all of the different default statements uh, that we will need uh, to handle it. And the usage of this component will also be pretty difficult to read because now we not only need to go and find where that item is listed, what it is, but then we will need to go and decipher what each of the items is and what it does. So I alluded to it a little bit earlier, but the fun fact is that this general idea of uh, uh, a config file driving the entire UI is uh, how, how we approach the first group of concept for, uh, for the data loader. It was a much bigger scale, of course, because it described like, multiple pages, uh, all the elements that were on those pages, like the, the actions, navigation uh, items, etc. Uh, it was a lot. And it should come as no surprise that it was just a massive pile of over engineered maps. Um, and it was met with some very well deserved criticism. But the absolutely best piece of advice that they got them was why don't you just do it the React way? So, what if we wrote what we knew at the time and used just one of the most fundamental pieces of that we are covers. So the children pattern is one of the most absolute basics of React, and I think it's a little bit underused, at least based on the context of how it worked with in the past. And it's one of the best tools that we have to improve not only readability but also composability of our components. So the menu component that we've seen before would now be used something like this, and this is immediately clearer to, see, to read and make, make uh, sense of at a glance. We immediately see that there are a few links, a divider, there's a local button with an item next to it. And the implementation of the menu component will also be simpler because we no longer need to care about like, different component types, action types, item order, and whatever. Menu component now only worries about uh, displaying the content not deciding what it should be. So in this particular implementation, I'm using React children to array just to make sure that children is an array, so I can map over this. This covers a use case where we pass only one child. <coughs> but 
So you can make it even simpler and do what probably most same people would do these days and create a list item component. So the menu component is now simpler still. We no longer need to map over anything. We can just accept those children. And it also gives us much better control over each individual item. The only downside is that the use for this component will be uh, slightly more verbose, but honestly, it's not, not a big deal. So here's an example from our own code base. Uh, so in MPL, we have a lot of forms, and I mean a lot of forms. We use Formic, a library called Formic, to handle all the form data. And just like Formic itself, we're using a render prop pattern where we treat children as a function. So here's how the form looks, and it's really not nothing too complicated. It's just a handful of fields, a couple of CPAs at the bottom that are disabled until all of the required fields are provided. Uh, if testing of the connection went okay, we will show a success message. If something went wrong, we will show an error. And here's a simplified implementation, right? So as you can see, this component will accept uh, several props from the parents, so like not on, on submit handler, uh, validation schema and initial form values, and uh, it handles uh, well, enabling disabling uh, those CPAs permanently as well. And all that component is, aside from the forming stuff, is it's a form with a couple of CPAs uh, that the validation uh, uh, rule that handles whether they are enabled or disabled, a uh, connection state component which will decide uh, whether to show or not a success or error message, and that is it. It doesn't know anything about children, other than it's a function that, uh, that will accept a few arguments. So, here's, uh, and by the way, we use this pattern uh, because uh, we have a few use cases where uh, exposing those values, errors, and set field value method is important for the children. Uh, and we use it uh, this way because we don't know what those children are yet. So, here's how we uh, implemented the Form that we've seen earlier that connects to MySQL. So you can see that uh, we're defining all of those uh, fields I mentioned earlier that will submit validation schema initial form values and we are passing them to the connection form. And this is the fun part. So instead of passing in children as we did with the menu component, we uh, present a function that exposes those values and errors. I'll just think about this for a second that we exposed here, that we accepted as arguments to the children function. So it's a bit of a funny pattern if you haven't used it before, but if you find a good use case for it, it is incredibly powerful. And using children like that, uh, we can compose them however we like. We can move them around, we can uh, style them however we want. Um, and generally there are two main benefits of this approach, for us at least. First one is reusability, because we can use this connection, uh, this uh, connection from component wherever we want, and we do actually. Um, and we know that it will always look and behave exactly the same, regardless of what fields are being rendered. And also it gives us a tons of resilience because it's not trivial to respond to design changes and to move fields around or add or even them if we want to. So, you see how children pattern can be incredibly useful, uh, but it doesn't solve every pro problem, of course, nothing does. So I mentioned earlier that the core uh, user journey of creating a data pipeline is fairly simple. Uh, user needs to configure the source, uh, let's just say the SQL database, choose which tables to extract, then they need to configure their destination, uh, this can be a slow data instance, uh, and then set up a schedule, which means how often this data transfer should happen. Along the way, uh, as the user fills out all the form data, we uh, save it all in the context, there's an overarching context that uh, that sits above the whole journey, and components themselves can pull data from context as well, just to cover a use case where a user uh, fills out a form on one page, go to the next page, but then wants to go back to change something, that form is still repopulated with the data they input. At the end of that uh, uh, journey, a uh, user can hit the create pipeline button, and this in turn will run the build request function. Uh, this request will uh, pull out all of the relevant data from the context, uh, uh, create a valid uh, network request, and send it over uh, to our backend. Now, the challenge here is that uh, every source is different, every destination is different. 
uh, they might need different validation data, they might need different connection data, they might need a different connection uh, method at all. Uh, table schemas can be different, etc. etc. And we will have dozens of sources, multiple destinations, and we would like to have a single generic entry point uh, that uh, will generate a request for any number of source to destination combinations. And the way we've done it is using the factory pattern. So let's start with that single entry point, that uh, one function, how it is used. And this is a simple trade from our production process. So we're passing it just a handful of arguments, and it makes it simple because it's just a single generic entry point. And this is how it's implemented. And again, this is not a simplified implementation, this is genuinely from our code base. All I've done is remove some types of annotations. So you'll see here that the source data and destination data are decoupled. This is very important. And uh, they are both calling their own builder functions. So let's have a look at the build source config is implemented. The build destination config is implemented. And this is where the factory pattern comes into play. Right? Uh, thanks to TypeScript, we can guarantee that source config will always have the config type key. And uh, this config type will follow the source config type schema. So all we need to do is just to look for which, which one uh, do we need to, uh, which one was provided. And then return the correct, uh, correctly, uh, correctly built uh, request data. And the factory pattern is also a great fit for conditionally rendering uh, React components. So consider this: uh, every single source or destination will need some sort of a credential to be able to connect to them. It can be a password, a passphrase, um, all of credential, uh, cloud credential like AWS or uh, GCP. And uh, we're not, of course, displaying actual passwords here. When the user needs, when the user creates a credential, we assign a label to it, and this is all we are operating on uh, on the front end. Actual credentials are handled securely on the back end, of course. So uh, the behavior of all of those components needs to be identical. The user runs on the page. We fetch a list of the available credentials of that particular type and display a loading screener while that uh, uh, is happening. Um, when the request comes down, uh, we, sh we see the input field, the user can type into it, a drop down will appear with uh, items matching the query, there's an add credential button and a map, uh, map, manage uh, button underneath the input. So the challenge is this, even though the top level components, the loading spinner, uh, the input, that uh, those couple of buttons that we've seen, those will all look and behave identical. Well, I step aside from the buttons. Because when we click on the, on the add credential button, we need to show a form specific for this particular uh, type of credential. This is because uh, different credentials, of course, will have different types of data needed, different forms with different behaviors or with different APIs. Um, and the manage button will also need to open manage section, manage overlay, uh, specific for that particular type of credential. And this is again uh, where we needed like a single entry point with a fairly minimal API that uh, we will be, be able to use all over the codebase. And we ended up with the credential selector the component. So this is an interface for it. And you can see that the API is pretty small, especially given that three of the props are optional and one of them is a class name. So we use React Query for all of our data touching across NDL, and this gives us a very, uh, very uh, nice ability of passing the query to a component. So here the parent will pass in the query that fetches the credentials into the credential selector, and then the credential selector will fan it out to all of the components that need it. Uh, we, can, we know for a fact that every single uh, uh, response to, to those credentials will have exactly the same shape. Uh, and also the query has uh, some important metadata like is loading, is error, is success, and, uh, and all that good stuff. So all the components know how to react to that. And type, of course, is the most important prop because uh, this is what will decide which components are actually getting rendered. And it's nothing but an enum. It's really nothing, uh, nothing complicated. So if you're not using Java TypeScript, uh, you can just use a regular JavaScript object for it. And here's how, uh, here's how the credential selector is implemented. So the, just a simplified implementation here. So we can see that it is handling, uh, like loading state what happens if there's no data, it handles, handles errors as well, of course. And so this is based on the provided query. 
And then we will see that the credentials on the input field and the manage button underneath. So when the user clicks on the app credential button or on the manage button, we will, just, we will render either the app credential model or the manage credential overview. And this is where the factory pattern comes into play again. So, well, just like in the previous example, all we are doing is using just a simple switch statement, uh, look at the type that was provided, and return the correct, uh, the correct component. So the factory pattern is incredibly powerful, and this particular implementation is also a good example of um, the open cost principle, the O in solid. Because now uh, we can add new uh, cases easily without worrying about changing or breaking anything in the existing ones. So as we add new sources or new uh, credential types, all we need to do is uh, extend the correct enum and then add a new case in the switch statement. And to tie it back to the beginning of this talk, like, did we come up with all that straight on the bat? Did we create a credential selector or the build request body component all for the um, collection from straight away? And of course, no, no, we didn't. Uh, we first created several different ones, several different uh, uh, components or functions, uh, and only, on, only when we saw clear patterns emerge, well, and when some of our started shopping at this fortification, uh, only then did we actually went back and created the abstraction that we see today. So really here it is folks, the, those five ideas that uh, we talked about when creating NDL. And of course this is not an exhaustive list. There's much more to create a good system than that. I didn't even touch on anything about uh, testing, uh, routing, uh, bigger infrastructure or anything like that. But those general ideas of not jumping to the conclusions of to, to early conclusions. Uh, not tying ourselves to a specific implementation and uh, focusing on those established design, design patterns help us create a code base that is better prepared for what's to come. And as mentioned earlier, nothing in this talk is new and groundbreaking. Those uh, patterns that I mentioned are, you know, are probably old and boring, but uh, they are battle hardened and called fundamental for a reason. So front-end engineering is at a breaking pace. So we've uh, heard jobs for years that there's a new JavaScript framework coming out each week. There's been uh, lots of talks about front-end fatigue because we arguably need to know too much and what is right changes too often. Um, and of course, it's incredibly important to you know, keep your finger on the pulse all the time, always keep learning, always stay relevant. But in this uh, rush to, in, the, in this rush to do, know everything to do. Uh, it's really uh, easy to uh, forget uh, about the, the fundamentals and focus only on what should be just the icing on the cake. I believe that keeping those foundations in, uh, in mind will lead not only to a better code base, but also to just a more focused and more enjoyable day to day work. So this is it. Like this talk is really based on the work of people much smarter than I am. So I couldn't really take credit for anything else than just slapping a few of those slides together. So uh, please have a read through. Please have a watch of all, the, of all those uh, resources. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your evening.